Göran, welcome to the show. Hello. <laughs> when um, when we had our exploration corner, I got curious about your facilitation because I read a few LinkedIn posts and then we were introduced by a never done before community member. And you are doing such diverse facilitation and workshops that I'm just intrigued and cannot wait to dig deeper. So thank you for taking the time. Yeah, welcome. My pleasure. Yeah. And let's start at the beginning. When mm -hmm. did you start calling yourself a facilitator? And actually, do you? Um, I do, uh, but it actually started with having a clarification call on a facilitator course beginning of this year, even though what I'm doing is probably facilitation since 15 years, yeah. Or maybe 19. Mm. Yeah. So what happened 19 years ago and what happened a few <laughs> weeks ago on this facilitation course? Mm, I mean, like some people know very exactly what they want to do in life and some people are just like exploring and trying and like finding it hard to like put it into one box, right? Um, so my first profession was after after canceling a study that I just did like to have a reason to move away. <laughs> um so I had an apprenticeship as a graphic designer and I was uh, going very quickly into becoming a freelancer. And as I back then had a girlfriend uh, that once worked as a massage therapist on a cruise ship, I thought like, oh, let's see if they need graphic designers. So I went to this website of uh, a German like cruise company and uh, indeed there was a job for graphic designers and the job was not in the graphic design, but coaching graphic design to board tourists. So, and that's like how I, 2004, had my first, in a way, facilitation job to train people that are probably not like prone to go the 10th time to Fuerteventura or Lanzarote. Like they prefer to have a word course or something like on Google research or using the digital camera. So yeah, that was my first workshops, <laughs> 2004 already. Fascinating. And, um, yeah, a long time. So, but then I turned to stay for a while, graphic designer and copywriter. And with all the journey of things in between, we probably will speak about. So I just like found it like happy to have one umbrella, one roof where to put everything under. And this happened actually just like this year that I thought like, let's not just be a large group dude or design thinking coach or communication trainer find something and I find it quite helpful even though I see the challenges in terms of positioning yourself as a facilitator right because who mm. calls for a facilitator <laughs> yes that's true more and more do and yeah. still it remains difficult and still many don't really understand what facilitation is exactly. and the value of it yeah mm. and I'm intrigued by your first experience of training participants on a cruise ship mm -hmm. on a skill and I can see the facilitation challenge in that because on the one hand they're very diverse they cannot run away they, but they're still in the same experience <laughs> so what did you learn about facilitation back then and creating this experience or this course for them yeah I mean like I was super not experienced in that right I mean I could ex I could experience that I have a skill for that something like naturally given in a way and it was very diverse so what I did like with the mediocre internet and with the knowledge that I acquired at this time to carve some basic courses I mean I had I think I had some manual from the organizer um but what I really found out on a cruise ship um there's people that need someone to talk or like to run away from their partner because otherwise you're like trapped with your partner all the time on a two weeks cruise, right? So um, I had some nice experiences, even some odd ones, but I remember most like the this old man that told me really his life story, very extended. He just booked the whole course for himself. And like, I just listened to his life story and could make my money with listening. <laughs> so it was interesting. And later on he said like, like this is my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so it was interesting to see like like how this whole thing works because I would have normally like refrained from being on a cruise ship and there was like David Foster Wallace book back then um he, he got an is a it's a it's a writer right a novelist mm -hmm. very away. heavy topics 
heavy topics. So, but he once got like a journalist cruise, like he got an invite to a cruise and he said yes. And after he wrote like a little treat, he called um, very amusing, but next time without me. And I felt a bit the same after like five or six weeks on the cruise. So, but I had an extremely enriching experience, of course, mm -hmm. about social dynamics, consumption, um, capitalism, because a cruise ship is like one of the best metaphors of capitalism, right? So, yeah. So I'm just like was thrown in cold water, as we say in German. Um, but I could like do very different things from digital camera, Google, how to build a website, um, Photoshop, all this yeah. stuff. And somehow it worked. I mean, I was challenged. I sweated. I was nervous because I was 25, naive, <laughs> unexperienced. Um, but there were like grown up people that wanted to relax and just do something different. Mm. And I I can relate to that. And somehow I think it's something that never really changes that you prepare for one thing or the client tells you that this is what the workshop or the training shall be about. And then the participants arrive with their own context and their own needs. And actually what they need is something totally different. <laughs> and there you are, yeah. this dynamic. Um, and you have to deal with it with whatever shows up in the room. Exactly. So yeah, that like reminds me to this like figure, I think like that many of us facilitators have that there's maybe often a workshop behind the workshop. <laughs> mm. What do you mean by that? Um, I mean, there's like something that looks like the public requirement of an organization or a team or whatever. And some people maybe want just to shine because they organize that or like management is doing management by checkbox and invite an innovation workshop where everybody goes just because of an invite, but not of a intrinsic motivation mm, or, like or a calling. real purpose. So, and you, I think it's like very tough task to find that out. I mean, increasingly you find ways to find that out in advance to be better prepared <laughs> to probably then find even something else out, right? <laughs> yeah, and then... Oh gosh, this would be an entire different conversation, but then whom to be loyal to? Are you loyal to the client who hired you maybe for a checkbox innovation workshop or loyal to the participants who actually invest their time and attention? That's a good question, a really good one, because I think I was really in situations that made me torn. Um, I want to give you an example of an automotive uh design thinking workshop in a big program of innovation so and i just uh, i was facilitating a design thinking workshop where it's like mandatory to have a multidisciplinary team what they sent me was like all like mid 40 male engineers in like this kind of like um classy engineers shirt um uh, that were only responsible for the refined development of like the the things that lift up and bring down the window in your door, you know? Mm. So specialists for this knob that you push, that the window goes up and down. 25 of them. And the outcome was expectably bad. <laughs> like disappointing. The setup was bad. And at the end, I just like said, look, that's what I told you before. And then they told me, yeah, but we didn't believe you. <laughs> so... That's like the school of hard knocks. I think we all go through to just learn to naturally anticipate things, asking the right questions uh, to find out, okay, um, it's just like programmatic or they really want to achieve something. Mm -hmm. And sometimes maybe it's just good to serve the programmatic need. Then they are happy. It's not like what I want, like from the idealistic point of view, but okay, if that makes them happy. I swallow a little bit like this bitter pill, but I made them happy, right? <laughs> yeah, and as long as it's not against, or as long as it doesn't mean to manipulate or facipulate the participants who then waste their time. Facipulate. I don't know how you see that, you know, like often when I go to corporate environments, I think they're per se, like there's like a built-in amount of time wasting. Mm due to regulations, systems, procedures, um, bureaucracy, procedures, communication ways, processes. So that's why I can just also go there um, and try to give like a little reflection of what's going on. Um, a colleague of mine said like as an organizational 
all organizational consultants are always organizational refugees or runaways. <laughs> so that's where we go and run away. We go, we see like, oh, I could I could not work here, but you could make it better so I could work there, right? <laughs> so just try. Yeah. Sometimes and then energy. and it's true that uh, we do need a hinge of pragmatism or realism to also be aware that they can come up with the best ideas, but then when it comes to implementation, usually I think in 90%, they find out that actually they don't have time and then but how to boil it down, set expectations. Yeah. And that's like a little mission I gave to myself to grow the understanding of what a workshop is because people mm -hmm. see it like as the, maybe like original term is like this boxy thing where we all meet and do something together to do something together in order to get something done together. But it's just like stirring up, aligning, defining goals, having maybe a prototype or kind of an artifact and the real work of implementation begins then. And I try more and more like to sell a package of, there's the big preparation, there's the after work and the impact measuring or like impact goal agreements, blah, blah. And there's like this little thing in the middle, which is the workshop, this actual thing that you just think is the workshop, but the workshop is the whole thing. Just like try to find like new ways of wrapping that. But um, this problem, I think like we all, like all the corporate facilitators know that there's kind of a, a practice of nonsense in a way of wasting a lot of time by not thinking in advance enough. Mm. So how the echo of what we achieved there, because I know everybody's happy. Wow, nice artifact and takeaway and giveaway. And then it's blown away, you know? <laughs> so and that's just like, like, is it like this too big to fail affordability to do so? Or is it just like not thinking along enough? Mm. I think from what I observe, and that's a good question, um, what I observe is that in the corporate world, many just run after. So they are very little in control to plan ahead. Um, but it's always an inch too late. So everything is always on the rush, last minute. And then they realize that they do need a workshop. And then they plan this entire thing, but then planning ahead that they actually need to plan and already reserve time for the implementation mm -hmm. is something I think this a very small minority of clients actually yeah, recognize or anticipate. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's something we should do to tell them before we even start the workshop to block time afterwards for the implementation and align. Yeah, totally. Totally. I mean, probably they won't sign it, but my observation is that, and it's even like there was a there was a study like a four or five years ago that the most successful innovation agencies are those that do one project after another and not five at the same time. Mm. So and what I observe is that the mediocre up to, up to like bad ways of thinking properly really thinking clearly properly logic systemic um like in continuation so that like you can see a reason you see like an effect it's not really happening because people have so many things in their head and it just like turns into like psychologically speaking like open gestalts you know like this open ends and you cannot really integrate something and if you cannot really integrate something you cannot really make sense of it mm. Yeah. So and this like goes down to the resources and the people burn out more and more because there's nothing that you really close and cut. And then you do the next thing. It's not very often happening. So many projects are even like taken with us without never really like finishing them. They're just still there and occupying headspace. Yes. Someone, I don't remember who it was on the podcast said that one problem is that change processes are never really closed to then also, yeah, to mark, to celebrate, to grieve, and then to get rid of the headspace. Yes. And we're constantly in multitasking. And this brings to my mind the value of presence. So how can we help participants to really land and be present in the moment with whatever will happen in the space? And when I think of this amount of presence, I think of non-business workshops 
And um, I know from our exploration course that you also facilitate ecstatic dances um, or more spiritual workshops. And I think in these, people are very present in the moment. <laughs> and I wonder whether there is something that you can use that you learn from one that you might even be able to use in the other. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, I I really like care for that there's like a pollination effect. Um, I was thinking about two things. So the first, because I facilitated here in Bucharest, where I am right now, um, an ecstatic dance, and I was invited to do the warm up. And just doing the warm up, I was introduced a hey, a new DJ in our lineup, and coming extra from Berlin to Bucharest. So people were like charged with a certain expectation. Many people came because it was the last summer dance. These things happened outside. So what I really felt contrary to most corporate workshops, there is some, and I try even to try to ignite this effect, this kind of sponginess of people. Because if you go to a, like, let's say like spiritual or entertaining workshop, people are spongy and they're relaxed. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're, they pay the price. Of course, they have expectations, but there's not this thing I have to. Mm -hmm. They're always there by like free decision or maybe their partner or friend just like, you know, seduce them to go. And then they may be like, ah, it's not so my thing to jump around here with the hippie dudes. Um, but maybe then they're like turned around. So like, and this sponginess, this curiosity and this connectedness that is like genuinely like to be found more easy there. That's something I bring into the corporate workshops as well. So meaning really like find a deep reason why you are here. This is like the one of the major things. And then also, and this I take more from the, when you say like spiritual workshops, as I also um, attend ceremonies. Um, speaking about yeah spiritual ceremonies with indigenous leaders. There's like a deep sense and validation of really the presence and the present moment. And I thought very often in the ceremonies, wow, how would it be to start very, and I, I see more and more narratives about the strong start in the corporate mm -hmm. workshop now, like um, like twirling around and LinkedIn to remind the people what is the value of being here together and like how every freaking moment is such a unique opportunity to make the best out of it. So, and the, for instance, the encountering exercises that I use in this kind of like personal development workshops, spiritual workshops, is something that I bring there. And it mm -hmm. frightens people, but I try to give them the awareness of, hey, look, you spend with these people here five days a week. By eight is how much? 40, 40 hours per week. So that's an average more time than with your kids and with your partner. Maybe you sleep beside your partner, but okay, your brain is off. Your awareness is in a way off. So wouldn't it be valuable to have the most best possible relationship with these people that you spend so much time with? And that sometimes is an eye opener and often frightens the people. But it's the thing, like you shut off things of your personality because you start hiding in all the protocols and all the, yeah, like this, what can I say? Like, I mean, like the realm that we are in, like it's it's a sorted, designed environment very often. And the question is like how natural it should be because as an employee, you want to serve the purpose of the company. So you have to function in a way. Um, but yeah, how we can make that more human without like losing the purpose of the company. And how to, I love that, how to relate the the sacredness almost of the moment. So these people are coming together, sharing their time, sharing their awareness, sharing space. So why not, and this is precious, why not acknowledge that? And then finding, a, if I understand you correctly, a personal reason, a deeply personal reason why it's valuable to be there. Yeah. I once met a guy that really touched me in such a company because, you know, like I'm like this kind of like organizational developers or contributors with my facilitation and consulting work uh, that always feels like, oh, if I would be hired here, I would die. <laughs> yeah, if it, if it really like an employee contract. And I tried that three times in my life and I really got sick all the time because like the basic setup, you know, we are sensitive beings. We have to be as facilitators. They are not served and I cannot, and like continue, if I continuously shut off this part of my personality, I really like, I vanish, I get sick. I have like psychosomatic symptoms after a while, or I start smoking or whatever. 
So, and they don't want that. Okay, I see you raise your hand. <laughs> so this is like stress. All the so self-destructive behaviors. It. Yeah. So there was this one guy and he told me, look, I go here every day. And the reason why I go here, it gives an opportunity to bring myself fully into this company. He was an average employee, average, whatever. No, no, I mean, like no measurement on that. So, but like the way how he said that, and this is a rare opportunity that himself, his power, his love, his creativity, his knowledge can shape this company. And he chose that way because for him it's maybe most convenient having that setup. But just seeing like this like 100% dedication, I found like, wow. And if a company, business or unit leader would have the ability to align, you know, like an like a indigenous leader with a tribe, like align the people and bringing in even like a ritual character because many rituals they were set to recharge us you know mm. so mm. but actually we celebrate with the uh, christmas celebration or the anniversary of the company or goal achievement and people get drunk and stuff but imagine that would be a bit different something where we don't really discharge it's super entertaining and socially bonding but if there would be something wow we contributed really with like to make the world better inside and outside the organization. Yeah. And what I hear is um, a sort of ritual. So um, it's funny that you, yeah, you came back to the ceremonies um, that you mentioned. And would you engage a corporate group in a sort of mini ritual or some moment where they can actually become present because and let me add something because i there are many facilitators who would start with a moment of silence or some meditation or taking some deep breaths together and i've talked to a few and maybe a increasing amount of facilitators who then say I cannot start every every facilitated session with a collective meditation and it's kind of overused and mm -hmm. forcing and reminding people to breathe is only one form of creating this present. What is yours? Or maybe you're a fan of collective meditation at the beginning. <laughs> um, I, I know that's like such a such a crucial and delicate question. And I know these corporate environments where like the word meditation itself or per se is already like woo woo or too much of hippiedom, you know? Um, I do that really by feeling sometimes. Um, I have a pair of tuning forks. I have them even here with me, if you want to show me. <laughs> um, I had a workshop this year, like my workshop workshop, um, where the members had to arrive. They, they came driving in the morning, like one and a half or two hours highway. So they, they got all on, like out of bed, like by five, like started riding like 6.30 to arrive in time. So they were already like stressed. And like these tuning forks, they have frequencies. Yeah, it's like frequency healing. Um, that super relaxes you instantly. And it was just like, who of you is stressed? Because I could see in her faces, they were already like, oh, so early in the morning in a workshop in another city and driving and being present, sitting in a circle. Many people are very stressed by that. Mm. I just made the offer, look, if you want to relax, I have something for you. No, I, I don't know. It's okay. Thank you. The one person said, I want it. And then I make like this, you know, like I, I bump them to my knees and then they vibrate and then put it left and right from your ear and you're totally like in an oral sphere. And it makes like instantly like, oh, it super relaxes you. So I gave this little service into that. And like from that phase, this woman made, everyone wanted that. Mm -hmm. So I built in always like this sacrifices for specials, you know, like there's like a like an exercise I can just simply drop. And sometimes maybe it looked technically or like by content crucial, but for me, it's always like connection before content. I read that mm -hmm. lately somewhere and it's like really important. So this worked well. I had another moment. Just one, sec just one second yeah, to, to, to spend there because I think it's a beautiful example of offering something that might sound woo woo and then, and then having this wall of, oh, no, 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 we don't need that. Mm. <laughs> And then this one woman, woman had the guts to do it. And then everyone becoming human. So, and that's what you offered them, right? So the permission to just relax and ask for something. Absolutely. 
and this group dynamic to have just one who starts with it mm -hmm. saying yes exactly causing a feeling i think people really have to feel it that's why i like really love the increased awareness like around embodiment even mm -hmm. it may become also an overused term um but i brought something to the corporates also from like a yeah more like like a conscious workshop that was around more conscious relating and sexuality but i was like supposed to give that workshop at the beach it was at baltic sea and because they had no space for me and it was like a, i was like wow that's so it's beautiful at the beach for sunset but it's an open space there are hundreds of people around or maybe like dozens it was not that crowded it was in covid times i felt what can i do because now i'm in this exposed situation i have 30 people here in a circle and i want to make them feel safe what can i do and then we stood in the circle and i was like okay we have to create safety for us but we have just the space so what i want everybody is take like the full guts full energy turn to the left and then we stomp a full circle in the sand and this is our protected space whatever is out there you are safe there just like imagine that and let's like stomp that circle and so we stomp that circle in the sand and we moved in that circle and we, we stood there and like also like advise the people outside to not cross that circle line so and the same thing i do in corporate spaces sometimes with the people in the morning, I said, like, look, this is a safe space, but I want you to feel the space and contribute to the space. Mm. So feeling is like feeling the vibration and contribute as I stomp myself. So I get the people out of my, I almost always start with the circle. I love the circle work. So I get them out of their chairs, a bit of a wider circle. They turn to the left so we can like walk in the right uh, way circle. And really stomp and say, like, even you can, like, you know, slam your slam your thorax, yes. slam your arms, but really stomp, like, really, like, put it in the concrete so that the that the people on the other floor can listen to that for a moment and get irritated. And then they're having some fun. And then, there's, you know, like there's something you really brought in already. You're stomping energy in a concrete ceiling, and mm -hmm. it gives, like, such a strong start. And it's not a meditation. That's, like, a inauguration of the room you know <laughs> yeah it is something like a ritual yeah and it's um it creates a a common sense of we are creating here something yeah and finding and a everyone yeah hmm? and finding a rhythm together mm. yeah ah, so this something is... Yeah. Have you ever been to a music workshop, like a rhythmic workshop or something? Have you seen these guys that put like, make like a circle of people, they, they divide them in four quarters and like do like hymns or like this, um, how's it called, like canon, uh, like and with different rhythms and they build up and build down and like you, you feel this click in the moment if the group is aligned with that and the facilitation of the musical conduct mm -hmm. like, made very well. Uh, and this is a feeling like to 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 synchronize people in a way. And which then I can imagine also puts them into the mindset to synchronize and to harmonize in the conversation that follows after. Exactly. Or um, I want to add like one more example. I had last summer, I had a workshop with a team that was already very sweet. So, but as many of these like workshop setups, the people are never together like that. Mm -hmm. And it's up on us to create this, what we call a safe space or a trusted space. So they came back from their lunch break and in a natural way, they assembled at another spot in the room already as like half a circle. And the other members came from toilet, from dessert, from dropping the dishes. And I had kind of a crucial point in the agenda, like for the content flow, but I felt the group energy so strong in this moment. And I said, you know what, guys, uh, we dropped this one, but we put the circle here as you're already there. This The circle feels too like they feel somehow like they need to be fulfilled. And I want everybody to sit down and use this moment as I see how, how carefully you interact with each other. And I just like want to invite you that everyone here can receive one sentence of all the other members that are allowed to speak in that moment. Why is it so amazing to work with you? Mm, oh, like a warm shower. Yeah. And they're really like, I could really see like how they were touched by that, given the chance to be that human. Mm -hmm. And I think when now the reflection that like comes up in my mind when you talk, I think it's the basic element I try all the time to remind them, you know, like it should be like a little coming home. And from there, you're much more resourceful yeah, uh, to bring the things in more playful, more easy and more whole. Yeah. And what I 
what I hear is are different elements. So in the beginning is um, bringing the body in mm-hmm. with the stamping, bringing the rhythm, um, maybe leaving something outside. Mm-hmm. Um, and then bringing their maybe vulnerable self in because giving someone a compliment as weird as it sounds is a very vulnerable act receiving a compliment as well um and i think that's something that um i guess especially in the corporate world many forget or unlearn how it is to actually appreciate um really appreciate someone for who they are or what they do mm-hmm. And I would be interested in this arc. So how do you, because to to get to the point that they come back from the break and you can invite them to give this gift to each other, something must have happened. And it doesn't happen by asking them or inviting them to the safe space. Now we have a safe space. So yes, this is the question. Then I have a different question that I will write down before I forget it. Mm. What just pops up in my mind is kind of a, I think like adapted or grown like readability, I mean for the space and for the people, and that's, I think a skill you can train. People have it more or less like, set in a like in a certain extent already, um, and I think it got much sharper for me in my facilitation since I'm DJing. Mm. Yeah, because there is also like this moment of. I bring the people like with a DJ set, I bring them to a point where they become, where they get out of their heads. I first try to get them really in the body, forget the day to be there, to feel themselves. And then it makes click. And I think like this, this feeling yourself as a facilitator, you can ignite through acts where you foster like self-efficacy. And there's another thing I wanted to add for the start, because the, yeah, sometimes I do the meditation Sometimes I call it just relaxation or awareness exercise or like the calm arrival or whatever to not use a term that I assume by my knowledge of the company that may trigger anyone. So I use a lot of like language awareness, of course, and how to label things. Even the exercises, they I often use them, the same exercises with different names according to the context. Um, but giving them a possibility to already invest into the room. So... Uh, what do you bring here today and what do you want to take away? Like this expectation management in the beginning, but also like, what do you bring in here today? What what have you, like what is in your suitcase, in your toolbox, in your heart? Mm. And then I let write them down and put it to the wall. So this wall is already energized and I love them to bring the just awareness. Look, this is this freaking gray, ugly conference room. And then at the end of the day or the one, two, three, four days, I let them reflect on how the room feels now. And I had it lately in Australia with a leadership workshop. It was the most ugly room I've ever been. But at the end, it was so colorful. It was so, it was our room then, you know? And this doesn't happen if you just like write on a block of paper and put it like on the table. You really, Mm -hmm. I really really make them conquer the room with their work to explore and to bring that in. So the room is energized with an act of investment. Every like writing you put to the wall is an investment in the space. I love that what they bring and how you distinguish or how you invite them to not only think of their skills and knowledge, but also what do they bring in their heart? What do they bring in terms of attitude and energy? And I wrote down the word embodiment as something I wanted to come back to because you mentioned mm-hmm. it. That's also charged and maybe... Not yet overused, I would say, mm-hmm. um, but could. And then you spoke about your experience as a DJ and the act of music helping to get bring people into their body. So the, it's also an act of embodiment. Mm-hmm. Do you use music then also in corporate workshops? Because music is something that is also has a magic oh, of course thing to it um but you need to to use it wisely because with music you yeah you charge the boom or you set an atmosphere so yeah. maybe you can speak a bit about music and about embodiment yeah um 
like one thing from the DJing that I like feel as well, like in facilitation scenarios is like this moment of click where you really have them at the hook, you can say, where you really know now I can play them. Yeah, where I really feel, okay, there is a trust now. I brought them to a warmed up level. I think this moment as a facilitator, when you know you've given any direction in such a way that they can walk by themselves up from a certain point. Mm. You know, when you put them in their booths, for instance, design thinking workshop, you have four teams and then they are, you told them what to do. You explain everything so well. You have maybe co-coaches that like, and you're the lead coach and you advise them really profoundly according to a nice preparation. And then you see it's just flowing and you just go there and you give some impulses the same way I like turn the knob as a DJ and put a little bit of a filtering or take the bus out for like a bar, one, two, three, four, boom. Again, you know, this is like this, it's for me sometimes this magic that I see the same with the ceremonies where I go to, how the shaman there does something that people need in the moment, just like with some smudging or with an instrument like the right mm -hmm. tone at the right moment and they're recording the energy with music yeah exactly so what i do sometimes i use frequencies like frequency music you know for the meditative states there's like different hertz um musics that go more for the heart for the concentration for the relaxation um for activation for something um I, and i put them very subtly in the background you know like not a bit like white noise but it's more like frequency layers like the better waves that help yeah with... like a bit like better waves things mm. that sound harmonious for some people it's like oh what kind of pan flute is that <laughs> so oh you hear it already okay then it's too loud <laughs> um in design thinking it's like set already like in the protocol that to use upbeat music for brainstorming and stuff so i experiment i don't really overuse it in corporate workshops but I have it for breaks. When the break is over, music is over. Not always. And I also like experiment to announce like time slots, mm, what is better. And my most favorite thing is a little bicycle bell. I just have at my finger, you know, like a ring. Mm -hmm. And then just like a one, two, ping, like with a very like light tone because the time timer has this annoying four beeps. I don't know why is it not like designed differently. Um, and a gong is also too pathetic and you have to use both hands. It's like unpractical often. So to run around and if you go for different corners and the gong is very small, it's, it's a, sometimes also a bit annoying, but this little bicycle bell, even this cling cling, a normal one. Um, I like that. Mm. So, and for the, for the workshops, yeah, sometimes even for the breaks, I didn't do for a long time, as you remind me, um, to let them dance also sometimes. I have this like stop dance exercise, but I mean, this works quite well after lunch as a big energizer um, without music. So, but it's working with music as well. So yeah, it's like so-so in this workshop. But in the more spiritual workshops, and that's like where the whole DJ thing came from for me, I think I developed a sense like which kind of rhythm and tone is making them more easy to look in each other's eye, Mm. Feel something on the heart level to move their pelvis wildly or stomp or clap every like every certain tune like ignites more or less something in you so and that's what you can play with i have an assumption mm -hmm. <laughs> that i want to speak out uh, my assumption is that the experience you accumulated by hosting these kind of more spiritual workshops, and you mentioned the workshop about sexuality, where you have all different kinds of people there, mm -hmm. and they show up as human beings mm -hmm. wishing to connect with each other. My assumption is that this experience of seeing these different people, but um, with a willingness to connect, also might help you to see the humans in the corporate workshops. And the desire to connect that they might hide behind all these masks they're wearing because they're in the office now. Yeah, that's true. So it's like the, now you make me think about it. You're pro probably, I go into the business world without playing the business world, you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe like the major part of myself is like this human connection part. I even like designed a human connection workshop for conferences, you know, like as a opening and closing ceremony. And I, and I found it very useful because, you know, like Priya Parker's book, like how, how we, or why we gather, mm -hmm. because there's so many like classy protocols, how this is going, but no one is there to really bring people together. 
to really align them using this unique chance for networking, learning about topics, because you go there, you get your batch, um, you go to the buffet, maybe there's even an evening party, yeah, alcohol for free. So, but like how we encounter each other. Yeah. It's a cool question to ask. What is a way to approach someone appropriately? Yeah. How to say thank you or like, or maybe like, what does it mean if you get a business card? What, like, see the pure opportunity. You know, sometimes you just like track something back and you are just there because six years ago, a person gave you an advice or sent you a link. Yeah. And then six years later, something big happens out of that. Yeah. You never know. So treat it valuably, even if it doesn't look big or promising in the first moment, but you never know. Yeah. And what you just shared reminds me of something you said earlier about how you start the corporate workshops by reminding them why they're there and why it's important or why it might be important. And it sounds as if they need permission to connect with each other. And by having someone, a facilitator who invites them to engaging with each other, asking a question or sharing their story or just become aware creates the space of where they have permission to then mm -hmm. go deeper and show a little bit more of themselves than they would usually. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you, you know, this little meme where like the tree brings like the baby tree into the school and inside the classroom, there is an ax and all like square um, locks of wood as a metaphor, like how schools shape people, you know, into squares, a very painful one. I can see yes. in your face, you suffer. <laughs> so I feel empathy for the tree now. Yeah. So and I, I feel sometimes not for everyone, but I mean, many people need so much guidance and they design, uh, they, they, they decide to become an employee. It's a very safe bet. Mm. Yeah. But when I worked last time, 2019, as an employee, I really like saw what it triggered in me. And then I made an exhaustive list for being an employee and for being a freelancer to list all the anxieties that come with the deal. And I had many more in this corporate environment. Because there are so many determining factors. Maybe some people see it differently or maybe like their safety needs, they outweigh all the other little risks that are like horrible for me as a freelance soul, right? So, but I think we waste a lot of potential in human resources. And I really love globally to flip the term human resources into resourceful humans. It's just a flip, <laughs> you know? But then we would look differently. What is this person bringing? Because even like now when I sent a CV, my CV looks totally chaotic to a corporate. And then ask me, people ask me, why don't you get a nice job? You would be paid so much. And I'm like, yeah, but like my, my CV drives them crazy. It's not like fitting to their systems. Mm. Even I know I can be of a good benefit. So, and I think that we waste a lot of potential because Stephen uh, cannot show his, like maybe he's like an agile coach but he cannot like fully show his skills that he has also like in collecting butterflies, hypothetically speaking. Yeah. Because maybe there's this nice like registry in his head that could also work for starting, giving him the task of building like a tool library. Yeah. Because it's maybe like structurally like the same way of like thinking and then doing. So, and I, I think that. it would be do so well in getting to know each other, but I didn't even know that about you. And you can't, I can't tell you the number of workshops where I asked at the end of the day, what was the best today? Where people said as the first point, oh, it was so good that we all talk with each other since such a long time. Or, oh, figuring out that we all had the same issue. I thought I was alone. Exactly. I thought it was just me. Yeah. 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 And the permission, what you said with relating to each other, like the most painful sentence I heard after I put people, it was a company there like five, five sub teams of a major IT team that had to align for the annual goals. The problem was that like three of the five teams were not talking to each other. So the first day I did like strong embodiment work and encountering exercises. And the next day we explored with a semi like design thinking process, how to tackle the challenge to get all the things done in the next year. But I put them in eye gazing exercises after letting like letting roll them on the floor with the embodiment artists like toddlers so that they get like, you know, this embodiment artist told me they will be formatted. After that, you can do everything with them. And I trusted That's him. That's courageous. 
super courageous, 120 people, imagine 120 IT engineers, like the kind of personalities and they tell them like, hey, please like roll on the carpet here on the floor um, for 20, uh, let's say 40 minutes, and just do like this. And it was extremely long, but they were, they were empty. They were really like, you know, like empty vessels I could fill with what I wanted to. And so I could lead them into this encountering exercise. But then imagine like one, one guy came at this, after these two days came to me, he's like, Goran, that was the most crazy thing I've ever done. What? Yes. Looking at the eye of someone else so long. And that's just 30 seconds, not five minutes. And I introduced it, as I said, with it's important that you relate in a healthy way to have a healthy life and even don't carry that shit that you cause here as a team on your dinner table with your partner. Because if you do that for three months, you will have like a tilted relationship balance. So, and you don't even know why, but you just go there, complain instead of solving your problems at work. And therefore you need a good relationship at work. And I'm, I'm intrigued. So you did, because I would already think that the eye glancing ac activity is already courageous. I would see me doing that. <laughs> Yeah. But rolling on the floor, how did you get them to roll on the floor? I didn't do that. I just tr trusted my dear colleague to do so. And he's absolutely not a corporate guy. He's a dancer. But he was like, ah, sorry, your work is so interesting. Maybe I can contribute something. And he's more like this rap ghetto speak, you know? And I was like, it was, I think, my best space holding job ever because it was, I think it was continuously on the brink. So, and we had just like two people that sat at the side every other person of the 100, 120 people participated in that exercise. And it took very long. It felt like endless, you know, like on a trip. So, but then they went out and they didn't know what that, and it was the first thing at the day, the very first thing after we introduced each other, you know, and it was like, I could have lost the whole workshop at this moment, but I said yeah. like, let's do it. But I think as my colleague introduced himself as a movement artist, this yes. artist before yes, yes, yes. gave some kind of like immunity to him. And that's very interesting because I think it would be different if you as a facilitator say, oh, it's, now we're doing this as a warm up, as Probably, opposed yeah. to a dance artist. Oh, now we're doing some dance. And for mm. the dance, you roll on the floor, but it's still dance. It's not a <laughs> silly floor yeah. move. And again, you mentioned the word embodiment. Yeah. What What is your definition of embodiment is it simply using the body getting into the body um i think it's like getting aware how things like land inside of you because i mean especially like due to like more hybrid or digital working we are so focused in the head and even if i run online workshops i let them move and dance and carry things around or like everything like i even invite them to write all the time with pen and paper so they mm. use their body but for the exercise of yeah, feeling seen, feeling given permission to speak out what was crap and shit in this company for five years, but then also like to bring them back by tell each other how it felt. So when I engage them in telling stories, I look really for experiences. So like design thinking did a great job in my facilitation skills, definitely, because it's so multifaceted. And I see even in all the colleagues that run these workshops since 10 years, they become more refined human beings, definitely. Mm. Curiosity, embodiment, different layers of curiosity, questions, courage, experimentation. Mm, thinking with your hands. Thinking with your hands is a very nice term, actually, really true. Um, so yeah, that they that they feel that. Like, how is that even sometimes like, like a little constellation work? Or just like, can you make can you make a body posture that tells me how this management decision made you feel? you know somebody's crampy like that or maybe like someone is released and like opens the into a hero pose mm -hmm. yeah and this is why people don't especially be germans or austrians or swiss people are not like expressive you know that's why i love like do workshops run workshops in africa mm. or like in in, in, in some anyhow like latin countries where people are more expressive or like laughing having a smirk making dirty jokes tricking you into something even you are the facilitator you know yeah take the piss out of you being, being a little bit less professional, air quotes. Yeah. Yeah, this is kind of a professional. Prof I think it's not professional to be like this, you know, to be not human. Yeah. It yeah, it's air quotes. Mm. 
there's like high security context okay you have to have a very strict protocol and rule you know but maybe still you can be human as a pilot you can be maybe still human as a security officer or whatever you know but in a corporate environment where the things majorly are safe i think it's so stupid to cut that things off because i think with this cut off or the suppression of certain facets of us other things get misaligned so we're not attuned, you know, we cut off a sense, but we are a cognitive wholesome thing. Mm. And how you feel about that, I mean, we should not, it should maybe not overused. And I look at the language of people like people sometimes like by, by the scheme of transaction analysis, probably they overuse like from the child perspective. I don't feel well with that. You know, when I hear that 20 times in a workshop from the same person, I will tell something about that the obviousness mm -hmm. of overusing that probably but basically i think we are in balance when we are in balance yeah use everything and i like what you mentioned earlier that when we are not in balance when we cannot bring our full self or when we're in conflict at work we'll carry this back home mm -hmm. and it does have a trigger effect and then it becomes a vicious circle mm -hmm. so breaking this um yeah, it's a beautiful opportunity for a facilitator. Mm -hmm. What remains your number one facilitation challenge? Yeah, this was the question. <laughs> I think really to, to display, to show what facilitation is capable to do and change and how important it is. Like my favorite term that came up to describe my work is sometimes I use the term like I'm a relationship designer. So I design or like I design a space where communication among people can happen in a way that they achieve their goals and feel well with it and the outcome. So and to make this clear that this is not just like a skill that can be really like an art or profession. Um, I think that's the major challenge we probably most of us face. So I think like in, yeah, like the last year shifted a lot. Like I, I told you, I used this kind of like anticipation by doing a, a narrative analysis before. So speaking with people before the workshop about a lot of delicate topics building already personal relationship to each single one. If it's not more than 10, 15, of course I cannot do that with 100 people but even then um i built allies you know mm. for my workshop but also built allies for the thing they want to achieve and i built allies for why they are doing that so it's really this yeah it's it's kind of a bonding work and it assures me more effectivity and efficacy to to work from a common ground as human beings and then your challenge is that this is not recognized or it's difficult to to enroll a client in this mission? Or what's the challenge? Mm, no, I think the challenge is more like even more general to make visible to a wider audience that they would need facilitators to mm -hmm. solve problems. So often I hear the sentence, we have no money for communication. So, but that means like, okay, you have no either insight how important communication is. And I always love to employ my favorite quote from George Bernard Shaw that says, the biggest challenge with communication is the illusion it has taken place. <laughs> <laughs> because I see even in the workshop, people like they talk, you know, they do not talk enough really and not, especially not listen enough. And yes. And one of my podcast guests once said, and I think, the most important question is the follow-up question. Because we might ask a question, then we hear something. And instead of asking again or digging deeper, we either reply, oh, yeah, yeah it's the same for me, or oh, I don't mm -hmm. agree. But that's a missed opportunity to actually build a connection because the follow-up question is basically the sign that, oh, I hear you, I listen to you, I'm interested. My my most important follow-up question is, how do you mean that? What do you mm. mean by that? So, and I love this quote by, I see like how often I really like use quotes. Uh, Khalil Gibran said like, um, between what is said and not meant and meant and not said, a lot of love is lost. Oh. 
Yes. It's a really big one. And I, I, I transfer that to the corporate and I use the same and then they say a lot of money is lost. Mm. And people are awake. Yeah. And it's very interesting when it comes to international facilitation, as I like learned lately, um, because I introduce people to this like micro semantic analysis we use in design thinking. So if you have like a task or like a how might we do X, Y, Z question, um, to just assemble the team for half an hour, let everybody write down their interpretation of the question. You know, as you like assemble people around the table and ask everyone, think about the dog and now tell me what dog you were thinking about. And the one is talking about the sausage dog, the other one about the British bull terrier, the other one about the Rhodesian Ridgeback. And the same is like working with any kind of task you give to a team. And then you see even the personalities popping up because one person is more focusing on scaling, finances, psychological team things, design, well-being, or how to keep yeah. the effort most minimal. Yeah. Whatever. And then you have cultures that are very hierarchical. They say, ah, no, no. Don't do that because waste of time. When I tell my team, they always know what I want. <laughs> <laughs> so certainly. Yeah, the illusion of alignment. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because you don't have to put yourself in question with this kind of attitude, right? Yeah. I um, Something that I enjoy doing and it's similar is um, a question brainstorm. So before <laughs> discussing for solutions or ideas, okay, what questions around this topic come up? And yeah. then you also see all the different perspectives because an engineer comes up with very different questions than a marketing person or communications. Mm -hmm. And then also you realize, okay, the different layers, how you can interpret a topic mm -hmm. or look at it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love that too. From your experience, what makes a workshop fail? I mean, I would have said maybe like a year ago, lousy preparation, but there's kind of a like getting closer to what the workshop or what facilitation should achieve and to see however profound I do a preparation. And it's like with a DJ set as well. <laughs> there we have it again. So I put a sequence of tunes that at home, they feel super smart and super aligned and emotionally like the perfect wave you build as an ecstatic dance, we try to build one, two, three waves into a set. The people go really high and then I can land them. And that's a sequence. And the same is like an agenda. And it's representing your inner world of what they wanted you to be. But whatever happens in the room is something you rarely can fully anticipate. And then we have to drop things, shift things, or as I sometimes had to learn, oh, this is not a design thinking workshop. Some dumb smart ass invited me for um process consulting but he believed we can solve all problems with design thing and even if we had briefing and debriefing uh they tricked me into a situation where i can just like moderate like with the smartest of the process owners there and uh, to go through their things so um i think the management system around is a big reason for that speaking about implementation anyway um but i had once the case for a company i worked one month it was a project of with a sequence of workshops and in the final presentation so i was invited by a very high manager he he experienced me in another workshop he liked me like hey come do this project with us i did a one month project the guy to decide or to judge about the outcome of the project was a guy in the middle between me and the the, the guy that invited me what I didn't know is that with the outcome of the workshop, we proved that he did bad management in the last two years Oops. because he came with findings he should have known in his role. So he kicked down the project in the final presentation in a very rude way. And I was I was there uh, not like directly as a coach. I was like due to an agency. So that's why I could not really like, I would have loved to punch him in the face for this rudeness, you know? You can't do... So, but I couldn't even really speak up because, yeah, with all this entanglement. But that's why I do this um, narrative analysis before to really see, okay, is this project at the moment necessary or is it just kind of a replacement for failure in management? Maybe I should but not care about, but so that's, that's a little bit the challenge because from the facilitator or coach perspective, what I learned really like with hard knocks and design thinking, you can not not be a design thinker that like does something that so holistically affects an organization without being slightly an organizational like developer mm. or consultant. 
if you take it serious. If you just say it's a job I do as ordered, even you puke from that pizza, fine. So, but I don't want that, you know, like I, I feel like I have a deeper calling or mission when I do this job for the method, for myself and for the sake of the people that I work with. Yeah, and you have to have a look at the entity. So the, what's the entire organization? So a systematic thinking or approach. And I want to to ask you about the narrative analytics. No, how did you call it? I call it narrative analysis, yeah. Yeah. What does it mean? What do you do? I adapted that as like introduced before like from design thinking like to how to understand like a work task so or like a we use this term like how might we question how might we help our client a to tackle challenge abc in order to xyz so um when i'm invited to do a project or even a workshop or a training um i want to find out is that what they really need mm -hmm. Yeah, because and that, and that's like how I get into the like the, the juices of management and the entanglements and like the the string puppets that are around. So and I ask a lot of like interesting questions. I, I would say so. Yeah, like systemic questions. Like why are you in your job? What? How long are you in this job? Um, what do you love about your job? What would you do if you would? What would you do tomorrow if you would be your own um, uh, supervisor? Um, how long this company survives if your team continues as it does in five, like exactly. So, and then I had the company ones that everybody said maximum five years. So then there's a need for change, but they speak out what everybody knows, but often they don't dare. So, and I use that kind of narratives they use um, to see how's the structure, how's the social structure, how they think about themselves, their job, their colleagues, their team and the company itself how they interact with me because we have all projections and stuff. So I get a deeper understanding. I once worked for a helicopter engineer department last year as well. It's very interesting because I see it's a dream as an engineer to work, to build a helicopter, right? So it's very, very interesting. And then also to see, because it was in uh, Turkey, um, how the weight of economical circumstances is up mm. on people. So to, especially if you work internationally, I think it's very important. I think it's more important to do this than intercultural trainings. Um, I think you can really just find someone to talk to because the intercultural trainings often have kind of a scheme that is not representing the reality. Yeah, yeah we could yeah, we could have an entire conversation about intercultural yeah, communication. Totally. So, Then I then I see like okay like when I talk to fifteen or twenty people so it's some, let's say like till fifteen I can do because it's a one day or one and a half of interview work one and a half of integration and it's an upsell opportunity for me on the one side but it shows the client I I take my work serious. Mm -hmm. um, some people say that's a very nice idea but you will open like a wasp's net if you do so so we won't do that okay. Um, Wet flag. No, They know already about themselves, but they, mm. they it's like topics you cannot escalate that early. Like from a systemic, like organization point of view, you know, sometimes there's conflicts, you keep them burning, boiling or festering. Uh, and they need time till they really break out and they have to have the painful experience before you touch the topic. If you do too early, maybe bigger failure is the, the, the consequence. Hmm. So that's why I try to find out also then with my business partner on the corporate side, look, these topics come up. I see also a team topic, what to address, what are you afraid of um, and how to make meaning with the whole process, maybe for your whole department or whole company. Yeah. So it helps me really to contextualize. And I have like core sentences. Sometimes I print them in red and put them to the wall. Look, this is like what 80% of you said. So, and if you want to do this training, we should focus to learn something, especially for this outline, for that goal. So, and I give, even I make a nice PDF, it can be printed or just send it around. So it's for everyone or for the leaders, like a nice pamphlet of internal things that are brought to the outside with talking and listening. Mm. So, so yeah, making the implicit explicit and mm. then basically starting with yeah an analysis of what the the participants who are in the room came up with exactly and confronting them with it yeah 
And it even can, I mean, it's not really my task, but it's my curiosity and I love connecting the dots and seeing the system behind and like how that system is like vibrating and moving and feeling like where is maybe like a risk person in the team or someone that is afraid of being public in workshops or someone that probably when becomes too alpha or whatever, or like, or has like a hidden agenda, uh, it becomes all more visible. And they have already like a bigger stake with me um, because we are friends then already. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. In there's a, a basis of trust. Yeah. Exactly. And I took time to listen to them because that's even what like their leaders mostly don't have time to maybe do just once a year. And that leads back to the overall global problem of not being given enough time to what to do. How would it be if everybody could just relax and there's like a 20% margin every day to not be stressed? How how would it be in be working in a corporate if it would not be in stress? And I just see everybody in stress. There's no time. There's no money. There's no space. There's sometimes no rooms and so forth. And that's crazy. There's a whole machinery running in a rhythm that is out of tune with our embodied rhythm that would be there naturally. There is. And... I talked to about that with Joe Weston the other day and that there's also something numbing in this running and stressing and um, slowing down to halt and to reflect um, can also be see perceived as dangerous. So I think there's, I think even if you would give more time to the system or more money or more resources, there would still not be enough because A, there's Parkinson's law that every task um, expands in time to the time that is allocated to it. Mm. And I think there's also something maybe maybe human, I wouldn't call it intrinsically human. I don't think that we were born like this, but we became that, that we unlearned to to relax, to be with ourselves, to be with our, others. So there's something scary about that. I think there's a different, I mean, it's, it's a bit business and uh, business culture, but also like the given culture in a country like when you spend some time in a different zone i mean if you go to london you just like leave the plane you're stressed yeah berlin is also due to different reasons, stressful but i spent this three months in nairobi in the beginning of the year um it's squeezy but people are not running that much and i just get reminded to the movie down to earth uh, where a dutch couple like travels around the world to bring their children in contact with spiritual leaders all over the world and there's this one aboriginal woman in the Northern Territory in Australia that raises like difficult kids that otherwise would end up in like teenager prison. And you just like, says, I bring them like to agriculture and something. And then she's like talking about society says, look, people are running to hospital to, to get born. People are running to the kindergarten to bring their children. So everybody is running. You run to school, after school, you run to study and then you run to work. But there's nothing to run for. <laughs> and she made it so clear, we are all running. But what for? But I think it's a big pressure of the system of like this competition that is because it's not circular. It's like it's, it's competitive and exhaustive and it goes so deeply into our whole societal systems mm -hmm. and societies that are differently organized or just even by default because of, of a lack of technology don't have the possibility to squeeze in all messages just because the only thing that exists is now. Because everything is actualized and everything of the past is even just like actually like visible. Yeah. Like with the digital story. And um, I think like alters like in an unfortunate way, our perception of time and time availability. Yeah. And then it's the, it's an opportunity of the facilitator to, which brings us back full circle to the beginning, to presence. <laughs> you know what I sometimes do? Sometimes I sit there and do nothing for three minutes and see how they get nervous, how that mm -hmm. burns in them, how they think like I'm gonna I burn their time. And then I let them reflect on what is what is like burning and forcing in them that they feel already like three minutes in the beginning of the workshop and the dude has done nothing. He's wasting our time. And I just like throw them in this reflection and often makes click for people. So So what is your reflection question then or statement? 
what they think, think the silence come, but it comes from a like how they get nervous and I just like ask them first do you realize how you get nervous and then why you get nervous so and mm -hmm. there's a lack of trust I had even the client once I finished the morning slot of a workshop due to like very fast like keynote speakers it finished half an hour before before lunch and there was already like an artifact gallery that could have been screened again there was a beautiful landscape it happened in Austria and they got angry because I said it doesn't make sense to start any new thing now before lunch because it's another sequence so I just invite you to invite the time till lunch is opened uh, we have 20-30 minutes enjoy the landscape or like stroll and skim for your output of the first session we paid for this workshop you waste half an hour <laughs> but we do nothing <laughs> wow um yeah imagine like where they are it's crazy and funny enough you're the second of a week who told me about a client who got angry because uh, they finished too early where the other person i don't remember who it was said well the group arrived the, where they had to arrive. They had mm. a solution. Everything was fine. Yeah. Let's like enjoy having back. an hour back. Yeah. Yeah. You have like backwind on your flight. So you arrive earlier. Or maybe the, 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 the earth spinned a bit faster that night. You don't know. But you cannot like keep the aeroplane nonsensely like in, in the air. Yeah. I do what I do really like in regards of the stress people have. I shorten even like the workshops. If I have three day workshops, I do like net seven hours instead of eight very often. Okay. The, exhaustion level, the exhaustion level after three days with eight hours of presence and concentration is very different to sitting in an office. And they're like, or like I give them like one and a half hours lunch break so they can serve their their need and urge to like reply to emails out, out of the system so like after one hour lunch you're here you do half an hour emails and then we start with our warm-up and so forth i build that in yeah what i like about that is um acknowledge the reality in which they are no yeah. because it's nice to have three days in a workshop but at some point yeah the nervousness and for some the stress is real and do you really want to wake up with 200 emails after three days? Exactly. So that's, yeah. you asked me like what makes a workshop fail. I think like a lack of understanding of the background of the people that are there is also a big reason. Mm. I just late last week, um, no last, what day is today? Well, Monday. Okay. Yeah, last week I had a, I had a design thinking online workshop and you could see like after two days, there was such a big energy drop. Then I found out this company had a new CEO. They totally like flipped everything around through teams in totally different shapes and orders. So, but just like simply finding that out in the workshop, because it's, I often zoom out and say like, look guys, I know we have a cool program here. I think you're like very ambitious people, but I feel I lose you. And I don't know what it is, but I want to ask you like, if there is something like, like big pressure or like a running project, what is behind that I lose you? Because like we had a cool connection yesterday and I don't have an obvious reason right now. And then I have often the experience, people say, ah, it's so good that you mentioned that. Yeah, look, this and this and this happened. So, okay, then we take out a bit of pace, maybe like lose an element that will be not crucial for the understanding of the method or learning in that project, some things. Um, but I don't want to be in the whole thing just with one leg. So, and I, I often had that, that really I zoomed out and said, look, we have, a, I designed a very cool creativity workshop. And like the first hour you were really ambitious, maybe three hours online, but does this workshop make sense to you? No, absolutely not. So great, your management invited for that. So, but they haven't, they asked you what you need. No, but they have like this new strategy program and they put us in lean and design thinking. We all don't need all that crap. We need this, this and that because we are like medical developers medical product developers we don't need these funky methods we need something profound like them 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 so ah but you didn't tell your management no we can't could you do that for us imagine this lack of communication that makes them that so much love slash money is lost yeah why why is that not possible that they talk like grown-ups it's a big question it's really a big question i think this is also things that make workshops fail and i think Okay, you can be unexperienced and you stumble in your first years. That's all good. 
but there's factors behind is good when you learn how to anticipate that or like how to bring the people on your side that there's not this forcing or this like friction force that is there because you have a maybe by management given a task and they have a management given a task but there was the lack of management communication with their team and they put you in a pit that should not be a pit but a collaboration arena you know yeah sounds as if all boils down to purpose and that's what you yeah. also opened with why are people there they need to find and Again, the um, full circle, what you mentioned in the beginning is why spiritual workshops or um, ceremonies work, because people have a deep sense of purpose why they're there. Mm. And if this is missing, you lose them. Yeah, absolutely. Safe start, safe landing, like in, in a, like in an, at least in an ecstatic dance DJ set, as in a ceremony. You know, every... It's micro, we, we are building, as I said, like relationship designer, we are building micro relationships with that team, with each single person in the team, among these people in the team, people maybe have never seen each other, but they were like invited to this design thinking workshop or communication workshop. So make them click first, mm. so, because this gives much more space, freedom, trust, safety. So, but if there's insecurities, you know, this, you know, this is like the, the real org chart. Yes, yes, yes. It's yes. a running meme where you have like the scheme of... Yeah. Um, I saw uh, an article last week and it was like said, the org chart is not transporting warmth. That I found very interesting. Like um, in German, it was like, it's is nicht wärmeleitend. Mm. It's, not, it's not transferring like the, the, the warmth of a nest that you have. That's very yeah. interesting. And then you have like the the informal structure behind this is like how the things were made you know the business it's for me not oh yeah and the meeting or like the negotiations went well accompanied by alcohol no the social meeting with alcohol made possible that the negotiations turned out to be beneficial yeah it's just like sometimes you look at things not seeing like what was the catalyzer i think like looking really what is the real catalyzer is like the skill i increasingly try to grow facilitation what i said like keeping it human making them really see each other and being seen by each other yeah and that's so much stronger than alcohol yeah and cheaper <laughs> yes. Yes. i think that's uh, something you definitely learn as an ecstatic dance dj right where yeah. people go crazy and dance and become themselves without any substance <laughs> yeah and then someone else that is not familiar with the concept asks, like what kind of drugs they have taken nothing it's pure joy <laughs> yeah Beautiful. Thank you, Göran. Most welcome. Dum, 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 dum. Dum. <laughs> so we learned to play safely. <laughs> mm? We learned to play safely. Yeah.